Hey, hey, hey. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Youth for Climate Live series. It's so great to see how many people are joining. Um, and if we can't see you and we can't see your face, we would love if you turned on your video so that you can join our lovely video wall. We want to make sure today's conversation is as lively as possible. So let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. And the chat is your space. So please share your thoughts, your questions, your encouragement as we go along. And if you haven't met me before, I am your co-host, Salina Abraha. And I'm your other co-host, Ahmed Badr. You can also contribute to the conversation by sharing your thoughts on social media with the hashtag Youth for Climate Live. And just a little housekeeping, if you would like to listen to the live Italian translation, you can change the language below. And if you missed last month's episode on driving nature-based solutions, don't worry, you can find it on our website, youthforclimate.live. Or even better, you can get a quick recap by reading the Lowdown blog. We're sending you a link in the chat now. So episode four's blog was written by Helena Teklu, the CEO of Seed Bomb Ethiopia. If you're interested in being a guest writer for the Lowdown, also just let us know in the chat box. And as some of you may remember from previous episodes, we recently launched the Youth for Climate Sum It Up competition, where one winner will be selected to attend and participate in the Youth for Climate Driving Ambition event in Milan next year. All you need to do is pick one episode from the series and sum up your key takeaways, either through a one minute video or by designing a visually compelling infographic. Please find out more by clicking the link in the chat. So essentially, any of you watching today could enter the competition. So if you're thinking of choosing today's episode to sum up, here is a message from the United Nations Envoy on Youth to help explain the competition and an example video sum up from Nigerian youth climate leader, Sheafunme Adeboke. Hello everyone, my name is Jatma Vikramanayake and I am the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. I'm here today to tell you how you can enter the Sum It Up competition and compete for a chance to win a spot at the Youth for Climate Driving Ambition event in Milan, Italy, ahead of the Pre-COP26. It's really simple. All you have to do is choose your favorite Youth for Climate live episode and sum up the main takeaways and the main messages. You can do this in two simple ways. The first way is through videos. Record yourself summing up the episode of your choice. It should be no longer than one minute and can be as creative or as simple as you'd like it to be. The second way is through infographics. You can convey your ideas and the key themes through pictures, numbers, and other visual elements. And don't worry, if you miss the live streams, you can head over to youthforclimate.live and rewatch all the past episodes. All three finalists will have their work promoted online and be showcased at the Youth for Climate Driving Ambition event. And the winner will get a chance to present their summary in person at the event in Milan, Italy, ahead of the Pre-COP26. You can submit your entry via the link in bio at Connect for Climate. Thanks for listening, and we are all excited to see how you sum it up. My name is Sheifumi Adebote. I am the host of the Climate Talk podcast and one of the leading environmentalists here in Nigeria. I was a part of the IG Life series uh, that talked about driving youth engagement and I just want to sum it up in one minute. For me, there is a need for more young people to collaborate with themselves. We should not be working in silos any longer. If the world really wants to take us serious, then we need to come together and work as a team to address these collective problems. The second thing is that we should position ourselves to amplify the works that we do. It's not enough to say, hey, they are doing this thing in Pakistan and then I'm not concerned because I'm in Nigeria. Or, oh, the guy doing this project is in Brazil and I shouldn't be concerned because I'm in Italy. It's time that we begin to amplify the work of our colleagues, the work of other young people across the world. So, collaboration and amplifying the message that we do. Thank you.
Um, so again, today we'll be exploring ways that existing inequalities are exacerbated by climate change and how this can have certain age groups, regions, professions, and genders particularly vulnerable to these effects. According to the World Bank Group's recent report on poverty and shared prosperity, four out of five people below the poverty line live in rural areas. Half of the world's poor, ch poor are children, and women represent a majority of the poor in most regions. The report estimates that between 68 and 132 million more people could be pushed into poverty by 2030 due to climate impacts. So it's important to talk about how governments, the UN, and the international community can work together to better include the most vulnerable throughout the decision-making process. And through that process, foster climate education, training, and awareness to build more sustainable and resilient communities. And to get us started today, we have a very special message from the Italian Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Ms. Emanuela Del Rey. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to the Youth for Climate Live series. I would like to focus on three aspects of the fight against the problems deriving from climate change. The following aspects are, in fact, at the forefront of Italy's international action. Food security, education and gender equality. Food security is certainly a key issue when it comes to fight climate change. Climate change can be considered at the same time the cause and the effect of phenomena such as soil degradation, water stress, natural resources depletion and loss of biodiversity. These phenomena seriously threaten the subsistence systems of the most vulnerable, especially in rural communities in developing countries. This is why investing in resilient and sustainable agriculture helps reducing the exposure to climate change and increases the ability to adapt to it. Besides increasing agricultural productivity and rural incomes, sustainable agricultural development also helps mitigating climate change negative effects by protecting biodiversity and, and, and reducing greenhouse gases. Another very important element is education. It is also essential to tackle climate change because education facilitates the process of understanding of the issues by young people so that they can also develop strategies to address, amongst other issues, the impact of global warming. Education encourages changing in new generations' attitudes and behaviours and contributes to the ability to adapt to the new conditions imposed by climate change-related trends. Climate change education increases the so-called climate literacy among young people, including through innovative teaching approaches and non-formal programs based on media networking and partnerships. Italy fully supports these policies. Last year, a climate decree was passed establishing a special fund to finance environmental education initiatives in all the schools with the specific aim of informing, training and raising awareness on climate change issues and also in order to disseminate the values of environmental protection and sustainable development. Sustainable de development is a very crucial concept that must become, in my view, part of everyday narrative of, of, of new generations, a common vocabulary. In this direction, let me mention another important initiative. The Italian Development Cooperation has recently approved the Global Citizenship Education Strategy, which is a truly important instrument aimed at empowering students to make them able to implement the SDGs and to build inclusive, resilient and peaceful societies. Their contribution will be more and more significant in the years to come, given also the changed vision of the world imposed by the pandemic, enhancing the need of a global mobilization at global level with all social agents involved. And by saying this, we come to the promotion of gender equality. 
because it also strengthens climate action. Women in all phases of their lives face higher risks and carry heavier burdens as a consequence of the impact of climate change, especially in poverty contexts. Women suffer from unequal participation in the decision-making processes and labor markets compound inequalities. These, as well as other social economic factors, prevent women from fully contributing to climate-related planning, policy-making and implementation. Yet there is no doubt that women can, and actually already do, play a critical role in the response to the climate change issues because they possess a unique knowledge of local sustainable resource management and experience that derives from their work at the household and community level. Women's inclusion leads to more equitable, successful, long-term solutions to climate change. Gender equality enables societies to enhance climate change mitigation, adaptation, resilience and well-being. Taking into account the gendered dimension of climate change is key for achieving sustainable development. I wish to conclude by quoting an African proverb that I always repeat to myself, especially when I talk to my children about the future. The proverb says, we do not inherit the earth from our, our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Minister Del Rey, for that message and that powerful, powerful proverb to wrap up the message. We also heard that Italy is actively working to ensure gender balance as part of their G20 presidency, which is such an important step to achieving SDG 5. And now it's time to hear from an incredible leader who has been at the forefront of advancing the sustainable development goals. Please join me in welcoming the United Nations Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Amina J. Mohammed. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And let me first appreciate uh, the words, uh, especially the last piece that uh, Minister Del Rey uh, bequeathed to us. Um, those are very strong remarks. But I really am delighted to meet you all. And I'm amazed at the young people that we have, even if I must give a shout out for the, the women climate activists here. But each and every one of you um, has that strong voice that is necessary um, not just for change, but for transformations, because we certainly can't continue to go on the way that we are. The transformations that are needed are deep, and that's hard work, and so more grease to your elbows. Um, I really welcome this initiative. I've had a number of um, conversations and, and debates with young people over the last two months focused on development, focused on um, climate action. And so this one, making the connection between policymakers and people who are at the forefront of climate action is very important. You all understanding that urgency that we need to take, and, and that's what we really need, is that you have a vision, but you have an energy and an urgency about not uh, you know, being impatient. And I think that's good for us, because sometimes we sort of have been there for about 25, 30 years, so it's a little bit long in the tooth, this new energy, this intergenerational partnership, I think, is incredibly important. You are rejecting statements now of good intentions unless they're backed up by action. And I think this is important uh, because you're holding us to account. Leaders need to be held to account. But remember, you will be the leaders now or very soon in the future. And those same accountability mechanisms need to get stronger as we go forward if we're to have the transformations. We need to see more of that on the global stage. And, and since the adoption of the Paris Agreement, some governments and businesses and some of our communities have stepped up. And we've seen that um, even more recently with some of the announcements that have come from the largest emitters and probably see a couple more before we get to the end of this year. But that's because you've been pushing. So I think we're all agreeing we're not moving fast enough. Um, and I think that that's where we have to be is the urgency. Um, climate change, the disruptions are huge. You are uh, magnifying them as you bring the voices of the people on the front line. So I think that it is understood. Um, and while we know that no country can escape the crisis, we also know that it is the more poor and vulnerable that will feel it most. Um, and the young people, largest cohort that we have. 
So what's the sort of action that we need now? And I know some of the questions are, so what's the UN doing about it? Well, first, I think our convening power around governments. Um, and governments, we did that with the climate summit last year. Um, but it was not just about governments. It was bringing in all the key stakeholders and some of the largest voices um, and loudest voices were young people. We brought in business. We did move the ambition. Um, and so what we got out of that in the coalition's work is what we continue now to strengthen and to um, make sure it happens at the country level. Now, we need to know that profiting from COVID-19 is the name of the game today. COVID might have paused the world. It might have shown how in, 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 uh, interconnected we are. It might have shown all the uh, inequalities and the cracks that we have um, in, in, in our foundations. Uh, but what it is, is also an opportunity. And we have to take up that opportunity. Why? Because climate change didn't pause. It's continuing more ferociously than ever before. And so it's exacerbating um, even what is happening today with COVID. The COVID economic, um, socioeconomic impacts are ones that we're grappling with now. We're fighting for those um, global response in financing so that we recover better, making those um, investments now. That's where I would say that for us um, as the UN, we are pushing to make sure that climate action is not an add-on, that it's an integral part of what we're doing to respond and to recover better. Where does that happen? It will happen in every stimulus package that we have in every fiscal gap you use, every debt swap that you, you talk about, tying it um, to the coalition's work, to things we're talking about in energy transitions, connectivity, industrialization, nature-based solutions. You have a whole menu of things that you have been demanding that governments and partners do. So essentially, um, ensuring that we really begin to root the green transitions, blue transitions that we need, um, that will show jobs, that will show um, technology playing a big part of this, um, and young people taking profit of that. We will need to make it inclusive. So it is important that we have a lot of technology that allows us to use data, um, big data, statistics that shows us where all the vulnerable, um, where all our vulnerable people are. Often we don't know that, it's not disaggregated enough um, and, and they're missing. So for us, I think we um, are focusing on the work that we do at the country. We're also focusing on cross-border work because in many of the contexts, we have very serious issues, not just from climate, dis climate disruption, but the conflicts. Um, in many of our regions, the conflicts are real um, and young, young people are not getting the attention because it's, it's somehow siloed. This is a conflict has a different approach, but climate uh, change doesn't know that. So how do we find an integrated response to it? And, and I think for this, much more work with you on the ground uh, to design those solutions and to implement them. Um, this is a different world now with no longer prescriptions. It's co-creating, it's collaborating, um, and it's trying to get it right, which is why for us in the UN, our reforms of trying to be fit for purpose for the SDGs is important. Please don't take climate action outside of the uh, 2030 agenda. The 2030 agenda worked very hard to make sure that people understood the unfinished business of the MDGs which is those first six goals, um, will be derived from inclusive economies, but greener ones, ones that really think about our consumption and our production, ones that really build strong institutions and governance, uh, ones that are built on partnerships where the stakeholder base is broadened, not narrowed. Um, and I think, you know, here uh, we struggle because we are so set in, in many ways, um, and somehow you've got to shake that up to make sure you get in. So our contribution to that, broadening that stakeholder base and really taking young people seriously, is that within the climate action team that the SG has put in place to really lift the products of, of um, the coalition's work in the summit last year um, has been a, a climate action group. And that young person's climate action group is amazing. Um, you've got so much energy, but more than the energy, you're bringing the solutions to the table that we should think about. Um, and, and within that representation in what is a bigger advisory group on climate action. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I'm also um, excited that we are going to celebrate um, and or take stock, I would say, uh, Paris plus five. Um, the journey to COP next year is a really serious one and you need to be um, not, not just an integral part of it, you need to be in the arrowhead because otherwise we won't get to, um, we won't get to Paris with impact. And um, I, I think that um, having uh, the, uh, the leadership of the UK, of Chile, of Italy, um, in all of this is going to be important and, and draw from the youth in those countries because they are the leaders of this particular process.
but you know, bring the rest of the world with you, which you know how to do best. Virtual rooms, um, 24/7. Um, so you know, thank you, and and uh, let's keep on uh, pushing for the actions that are needed and holding us to account um, to deliver on the results that are needed. Thank you so much for that uh, thoughtful, thoughtful remark, uh, Deputy Secretary General. I, you touched on so much, uh, you know, that we're trying to achieve through the series. I don't know if we're looking for a third host, but if you're free, please, please do join us. Um, and, and I think one thing that really uh, is really important that you highlighted is the need to include vulnerable communities, but include them in ways that are thoughtful, in ways that are collaborative, where we're not just assuming their needs, but asking them what those needs are, and then you know, bringing them to the table and then having that conversation and creating policy uh, from that perspective. And there are so many different ways of engaging vulnerable communities and amplifying their stories. And one of those ways could be through storytelling and through artistic expression. Yeah, actually, this is something you have a lot of experience with, Ahmed, and we don't talk about it enough, um, particularly with young people who have been displaced due to conflict, climate impacts, other causes. Um, and some of you may not know, but Ahmed has just published a book called While the Earth Sleeps, We Travel. And it so beautifully celebrates the voices and experiences of these young people um, through stories, poetry, art, and it features a foreword by actor Ben Stiller as well. So Ahmed, I've been dying to ask, could you please share with us a poem from the book that could help set the stage for our conversation today? Absolutely, and thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'd love to share one of the poems that kicks off the book, you know, as we're kicking off this this episode. Uh, and I think it really speaks to the topics that we'll be discussing and the stakes of those topics, uh, especially as we all work to create spaces for young people, displaced or otherwise, uh, to be heard and engaged on the global stage. Uh, so here's a poem called An Invitation to the Displaced. Here it is. Here's the, this is the project as of eight days old. So it's just fresh into the world. Um, so again, this is an invitation to the displaced. We are representations of a past we were deprived of embracing. Planets framing a lonely moon painted by the chosen few. Rough and soft hands, empty clasped fists, shaping stories until the spaces between our fingernails begin to whisper. You were meant to be here earlier but welcome to your rightful place. Write as you wish, tell your stories. I will gather your audience. Beautiful. Thank you, Thank you Ahmed. Thank you. It's amazing. I I can't wait to get my hands on this book um, and all of us, we can learn more about it uh, by going to earthsleepsweetravel.com. Uh, the link is in the chat and I can't think of a better way to welcome our young leaders to the stage to share their stories. So I'm thrilled to briefly introduce our panel speakers. Welcome. First, we have Fatou Jang. She is the founder of Clean Earth Gambia and a Trillion Trees campaigner for Plant for the Planet. Next, we have Louise Mabulo, who is a chef, a farmer, entrepreneur, and founder of the Cacao Project. And last but not least, Sophia Kiani, who is the founder and executive director of Climate Cardinals, as well as a member of that Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. We'll be having a Q&A session later on. So if you have any questions as the conversation continues, please submit them in the chat and let us know which speaker they're for. Perfect, let's dive right in. Um, Fatou, we'd love to turn to you first. So women and young girls often bear the brunt of environmental, economic, social shocks and this reality will only be exacerbated by the effects of the climate crisis. Based on your experiences working with female farmers in the Gambia, what are the best ways that you think we can truly include women and girls in decision-making and harness their knowledge and leadership? Thank you very much, Selena and Ahmed. I just would like to start by collaborating with what the UN Deputy Secretary, Secretary General mentioned, that we are not moving fast enough in mitigating the climate crisis that we face. And we basically have a lot of work to do and we need to hold our leaders accountable and ourselves accountable if we want to make sure that we advance effective climate action. And we all will agree that women and girls are the most vulnerable to the environmental economy and the social problems that we continue to face. And now added to that is the climate crisis. These are all due to the 
social injustices that we face in our daily lives. Women in the Gambia actually engage in agricultural and horticultural activities to sustain themselves. Women wake up as early as 4 a.m. every day to go to the farms, get products, and go to the market to sell them, come back home to be able to feed themselves and their families. We basically constitute the majority of the population in the Gambia, and this is the same for many of the Global South countries. Even though we contribute very little to the climate crisis, we bear the biggest brunt to its impact through drought, erosion, etc. It is always said, or I always say when I'm speaking in panels, that he who feels it knows it. And as someone that has worked with women and girls in the Gambia, I have seen the problems that they have been facing with little or no solution to their problem. At Cleaner Gambia, we have engaged in a series of three planting exercises to make sure that we support in the afforestation process in the Gambia. But we've also made sure that we engage local communities, especially women, to build their capacities and their knowledge to know more about the environment and also environmental sustainability. And we've also made sure that we basically use um, capacity building, we use our capacity building initiatives to train um, young people, which majority of them are girls, because in our school education curriculum, especially in the basic elementary level, we still don't have environmental education, which makes it very difficult to reach out to the young population. So we provide capacity building trainings and also create awareness to make sure that women and girls continue to know about the environmental crisis. I personally believe that boys' decision-making and leadership are very, very instrumental in advancing SDG 5, which is gender equality, and ensuring women empowerment. In the Gambia, out of 53 parliamentarians, that is National Assembly, Assembly members, only six of them are women. And out of the six, only three were actually elected and three nominated by the president. And in our cabinet, out of over 20 ministries, just four of them are led or headed by women. And globally, in our climate negotiation processes, and in our annual COP or climate conferences, out of the delegations, national delegates, is only women actually account for only 30% of this delegation. So you can actually see the gender gap that we've faced in our countries and also globally in making sure that there is access to women or access for women in participating or taking part in negotiation or decision-making processes concerning their lives, their well-beings, and issues that are affecting them. So how do we truly include women and girls in decision-making spaces and harness their skills and leadership? I believe, personally, we need to make sure we implement or have effective gender quota system because we have already realized or noticed the realities on the ground in terms of women's representation in decision-making processes. I personally believe if we have a gender quota system, it is going to make sure that at least women have a particular portion in our decision-making bodies where they can actively get engaged. Because we cannot have others come on board and talk about the things that we face. We know our problems. We know what we face. We know the environmental challenges that we face. And even though we know the environmental challenges we face, we have the local knowledge and the skills to be able to make sure that we take part effectively in mitigating the problem. So we need to be engaged or involved in these decision-making processes where we will speak for ourselves and advocate for policies and strategies that we believe will effectively mitigate the climate crisis. And if that is possible, having women on board to speak for themselves, then the issue of women disproportionately affected by the environmental crisis we face will definitely basically reduce. In addition, I also believe we need to strengthen our ACE process, that is the Action for Climate Empowerment, which is Article 12 of the UNFCCC uh, Paris Agreement. Even though we are engaging our local communities, even though we are working in our local communities to make sure that we share knowledge and build the capacities of the most vulnerable in terms of issues concerning the environment, I believe that our political processes and institutions are basically key in making sure that women have access to information and also engage in decision making. So if we have the capacities, if we have institutions, very strong institutions that basically make sure we build the capacities of women and also make sure we harness their potentials, then I believe it's going to also have a very important or crucial role in making sure that there is less impact in the, the problems that women face, especially with the environmental problems. I know we have very little time and I cannot be able to buttress on many of the things that I have um, on my plate, but I just like to end with this quote from Rose Savage that there is no more powerful voice than that of a mother, a nurturer, and a caretaker. We are stewards of the planet. We need to engage even more deeply to confront the climate crisis and environmental injustice. 
And I believe we cannot be able to confront the environmental injustice without having women on the table to talk about issues that are affecting them and for, and for them to actively engage in processes that will make sure that we solve the problems that we face. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And so I, I can imagine how many women who are watching today are feeling inspired by your message. I know it's a big question. It's not enough time to tackle it all. But I think your point on really addressing the inequalities at all levels and not stopping just just by saying, okay, we've built capacity at the farmer level, but we need to look at decision making at the highest leadership. Um, and thank you so much for pointing that out, Fatu. Thank you, Fatu. And now I would like to turn to Louise. Welcome, Louise, to the stage. Louise, as you're well aware, agricultural workers are on the front lines of climate change. You've been doing some really fantastic work helping farmers adopt sustainable practices and become more resilient to, to disasters. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your efforts and what climate change means for farmers in the Philippines? And we'd also love if you could share some key lessons learned that might be applicable in other vulnerable regions. Thank you so much for that question, Ahmed. And I'd like to thank you all for this, for this invitation here today and to guest Giamina Muhammad for such a powerful remark earlier, as well as Fatu, whose work I'm in awe of, and to Sophie, who will speak right next on this panel. Um, now, with our work, as you've mentioned, farmers in the Philippines are the most vulnerable group of people to extreme weather changes and crises brought about by climate change. In fact, the Philippines is the most susceptible country to hazards brought about by climate change according to the Global Peace Index of 2019. And every year, our small islands in the Pacific are ravaged by extreme weather conditions, and people lose their livelihoods and their homes in these conditions. And this is the only this is only exacerbated by the changing climate, with warming ocean temperatures leading to intensified typhoons. And the farmers we work with are the most vulnerable group of people to these hazards because their entire livelihoods rely on soil, temperature, air, and biodiversity to ensure that they can get by while they're situated right dead center of the typhoon belt. So we at the Cacao Project are working against the clock to build back better and create resilient livelihoods that benefit both people and planet. With the Cacao Project, we work with smallholder farmers to train on regenerative agriculture and distribute seedlings that are resilient and better suited to our weather conditions. Our goal is to revolutionize our food system so that it can holistically work with nature to protect our soil, water, and reforest our land. We want to position farmers for sustainable success by enabling them to build agroforests that are resilient to these weather conditions while being restorative to our landscapes. We've worked with over 200 farmers to manage and reforest over 85 hectares of land so far and counting. And these economic forests that we're building have done wonders already in our soil and water quality and in sequestering carbon and minimizing the carbon footprint in our existing farming practices while producing cocoa, which is considered a high value crop. Surprisingly, this system has contributed to reducing incidence of crime rates in our area because of better food security and a better income situation. And one of the lessons that we learned and needed to acknowledge is that agriculture, despite being essential, is still heavily attached to these negative stigmas, such as poverty, strife, and failure. In schools, they teach students that if you become a farmer, it means that you've probably failed in your classes and your grades. And that kind of becomes this pervasive cultural stigma in the minds of children and it propagates these systems. So what we've been working to do in the past years is to deconstruct the stigma and create a fair and equitable environment for people in the farming industry, especially in developing areas like mine. And instead of looking down at people who hold essential jobs and provide these valuable commodities, we need to cultivate an environment of respect and get them to understand their importance as they provide for the world's food and they need to be empowered to understand their value in our ecosystems and economy and in the survival of the human race through sustainable practice. We want people to understand that farming is a viable career choice for young men and women alike, as Fatu had shown us earlier, and that it can, contrib it can contribute to a system cha systems change in our food supply by reforming our food industry and tying in environmental stewardship at every level of this vast mechanism. Agriculture employs a big portion of humanity, and ignorance in this field can go on to displace millions of jobs and 
people in this industry. And if we can inform more people to realize its value in our daily lives, it can actually restore vast stretches of land and absorb carbon. Because in the end, our environment and our climate runs through the very fiber of our daily lives, in our breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and in the food that we eat. And we need to close that gap that separates our consumers from our producers. Thank you so much, Louise. So it's really, really important, I think, that you highlighted and it really this is in the vein of your entire work is kind of the economic and the social and the environmental dimensions and their intersectionality, right? And, uh, you know, positioning farmers for sustainable success is possible and you've proven that it's possible and you've done it in such a powerful way. Um, and, you know, the part about improving food security and that you know, leading to a lower crime rate is, is such an important uh, point as well. And again, your work is so intersectional in so many powerful ways. And uh, yeah, thank you for telling us more about it. Yeah, thank you so much. I'd love to, to turn to Sophie. Uh, um, thank you so much for joining us today. You actually tackle something that Fatu had talked about earlier, which is the fact that not every school is educating people on climate change and the impacts. Access to climate information can be a huge barrier. Um, and it's one that you've been working tirelessly to address. So can you tell us more about your efforts to ensure that everyone has access to this information in their own language? Yeah, definitely. So really my passion for climate activism began after I noticed the lack of environmental education available in Iran, my parents' home country. Uh, while I was there, I started doing research into the Middle Eastern climate crisis, where temperatures in the Middle East are rising more than twice the global average. And I also learned about how environmental pollution was really affecting Iran negatively. And so I wanted to talk to my relatives about these issues. But when I brought them up, I realized that they didn't even know what I was talking about. Like they had no knowledge of climate change or even of the environmental problems in Iran. And so when I was doing more research, I also learned that there are studies that have been done that showed only 5% of Iranian university students that were surveyed could properly explain the greenhouse gas effect. So there really was an educational discrepancy. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I decided to found Climate Cardinals. For the past few years, I've been translating climate information to teach my relatives in Iran because I really did believe that it's fundamental that people who are being disproportionately affected by issues such as climate change have a basic knowledge of what is happening to them. So I was doing that on my own for the past few years, and I decided to start Climate Cardinals because I wanted to empower young people from all over the world to do the same thing that I was doing, which was to translate um climate information and so we give them community service hours for the work that they do. Uh, now we've grown to over 6,000 young people in 41 countries and we've translated over 200,000 words of climate information into over 100 languages. And there are so many statistics that I really think back up the need for our work, like of the top 10 countries that are being worst affected by climate change, none are a majority English speaking. Uh, and even the UN, I think, has a ways to go with translating climate information and information in general, because usually most of the information is available only in the six UN languages. Uh, even with things like the IPCC report, that was only published in the six UN languages. And so I think that furthering access to climate information is so, so crucial because this is an issue that's going to affect everyone and especially marginalized communities disproportionately. So it's crucial that we ensure their access to this information so that they know how to properly advocate on behalf of their communities because we really want to empower these people to become active activists and to become advocates. And in order to do that, it's crucial that they have fundamental understanding and have all the information that they actually need. Thank you so much. I mean, this is, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of one of the massive barriers that are existing right now, because we want to see climate solutions coming up from individuals that fit their context, their cultures. Um, and if they don't even have that access to information, how are we going to move them to that next step into, into advocacy, activism, and solution? Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Sophia. I can only imagine. I'm sure people have lots of questions. So we'll be moving into our Q&A session in just a moment. So audience, if you haven't submitted your question yet, take the time to do so now. Um, and going back to this point on climate information, I love that like increasingly there's more and more resources available. Um, for example, in Italy, through its Ministry of Education, they've introduced climate and sustainability education in all schools. Um, and this learning can happen even outside of school. There's a great example from the United Nations Development Program. They're launching an educational website. 
to accompany their Mission 1.5 online and mobile game. And so essentially how this works is you as a user can vote on the climate solutions you want to see, and then those votes are compiled, analyzed, and shared with governments. And if there are any educators in the audience, stay tuned for a dedicated Youth for Climate Live educational toolkit um, and drop us a message in the chat if you want to know more. And speaking of the chat, I want to share some lovely comments. We have one from Shaylee, um, who, was get, who said that Louise's project really helps the entire community in all sectors, agricultural, environmental, economic, socially. I really admire that. So there's a lot of admiration going on. Um, and I think it's time to move into our Q&A now. Um, Ahmed, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, so before we go into uh, the Q&A, uh, to get us started, Deputy Secretary General, we'd love to give you the opportunity to share any reflections or questions you have uh, after hearing from our amazing speakers. Uh, and otherwise, we'll jump right into the questions from our audience. Thank you very much. I was hoping you would ask me to do that. Otherwise, I was going to just <laughs> Be a, you know one of those um, agenda busters. This is fantastic responses from from our three women on the front lines, and in each one of you had a message. And let me just quickly go through Fatu. I think the social justice piece is incredibly important, addressing inequalities. But let's look for the action in this because I think we often, as one of my late friends said, let's um, get past the agonizing to the organizing. Um, and when you see that number of women. Um, in Parliament. It's not enough. We want to get more. We want the quotas. But what are we doing with the ones that we have in place? The three that are selected, the three that are elected, um, in the space that they sit, how far have they broadened that space to include and not trying to just survive in the space? Because it's very difficult to be a woman um, in decision making in an all male environment. And they need space, they need help to open up that space. And so, you know, challenge the woman as well. Once they get there, as I was challenged, what are you doing about it? Well, I can say today we're fortunate with our Secretary General. We have 50-50. We didn't have that. And in a sense, you know, we also colored the UN. We became much more broad-based um, across the regions. You have all faces and, um, um, and experiences um, inside in the UN. So a real big, you know, a big shout out for we want the transformations beyond the numbers. We want to see what we do with what we have. What can we do? How can we make that um, much bigger? We also, um, uh, as I said, the, uh, the capacity building on the job, try to use, try to make that part of everything that we do. Let's not wait for capacity building to be in a silo. In every single initiative that is done, include the capacity building. So, you know, learning on the job is so important. And I've seen many um, women who have run for office and, you know, if they had the capacity building on the job, they would have done better the day after. So including that. Louise, uh, you know, look, we have the Food System Summit coming up. I hope that young people are taking that sp space that we made for co-chairing. Um, you were a part of the group, but we insisted that one of the co-chairs must be a young person. We keep telling, saying you're in leadership, but we don't exactly put you there. Now you're there, run with it. Because many of the things that you just talked about now, particularly when you talked about the changing the narrative, um, you, you, you talked about deconstruction of the stigma. Um, and I think that, you know, that's about changing the narrative where um, people come and see that the jobs, the livelihoods, they're ones with dignity and should be respected and they're not at the bottom run of the ladder. And that's up to us because if we want to make something of rural women and technology for young people, then we need to give them the best and not treat them as second class citizens even when we deploy um, that knowledge and, and those technologies. So the value proposition for, for rural, the value proposition that says you are assets and you're not just asking for the space as a matter of right um, is really important. And last but not least, Sophie, amazing. I'm so happy that we've got you as one of our climate advisors um, because you bring in a new um, uh, you know, lens to how we look at um, inclusivity. Um, and I think the language piece is better. I know I make much more sense to people when I speak my language. I can speak English and French till the cows come home. But frankly, it is my traditional, my, my local language that makes impact because somehow you can just say it a little better. Um, you, the nuances are important. Um, and that you know connection we're trying to get into people's hearts and minds to move the agenda is really important. So here, again, let's ask for the very best in AI to make sure we can go beyond the six languages. Because otherwise, we're just going to be looking for other pieces. I've seen with all this technology right now, Interprefy, you can do all sorts of things with increasing the language. But let's actually make that accessible 
and close that digital divide because knowledge is absolutely uh, power um, and the stigmas must stop. When I became Minister of Environment, uh, my community thought that I'd been demoted. Um, and I had to, the first thing I had to do was to say that the most important person in the cabinet was the Minister of Environment um, and that we were about everything. And when I went to the stock exchange and rang the bell, they said to me, well, what was environment doing in the stock exchange? I educated the cabinet. So education is not just for those that are at the bottom run. It's also for those in, in cabinets as well. Thank you. This is fantastic. Great energy. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary General. It's been so wonderful having you here, and I think it's just an amazing energy all around. Uh, I know you have to leave in a couple of minutes, but thank you so much. Um, any concluding words, anything you'd like to leave us with? I know we've touched on so much so far, and the conversation will only continue. Um, any, any final uh, notes, Deputy Secretary General? Well, I, I could have stayed a little longer, but I have to say to you that um, for me, it's always about the journey. Um, you mentioned just earlier the stories and your, your poetry right at the beginning. Um, you know, the, the integrity one has and um, the believability of everybody is in your story because no one can take it away from you. So that journey that you have, each footstep must mean something um, and it must be focused on what you want to make in terms of a difference, leaving your footprint on this earth that is a good one. Um, and I think that if you can make sure that that journey is one that you start today and you keep going at it so that you don't fail for want of trying. It's really important. We can be very cynical. We can see many challenges ahead and think it's never going to happen. Um, well, never say never. It only is impossible until it's done, as Mandela said. Um, but I want you to focus on the journey. I want you to focus on the individual and the collective actions that you can take. Um, so there's a lot of the software that needs to be put together with the hardware. You will, you will take those steps, but it's what you do along the way who you take with you and and remember that you know sometimes people will fall off you'd be surprised a decade later you will meet up with them if you left them well you will go further well um, and i think that that's important as well the human relations the respect for one another that we must have um, is, is incredibly important um, so i'm you know what can i say uh see you at paris plus five but um, every step of the way, every opportunity that we have, you know, call us into your space. We'll be happy to contribute. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, our offer of you being the third host still stands. So anytime <laughs> we have a few more months until next year. Um, but again, it's been such a pleasure to have you here with us. And again, the conversation will continue. And we're just very, very grateful to have you here with us with our amazing uh, youth speakers. Thank you. We'll be in the field in the next couple of weeks in Africa in about five countries because, you know, we need to we need to get there. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to meeting with youth when I get into um, Nigeria, Niger, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Mali. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. So alert to your Thank youth. You. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've been told. So it's a great invitation for everyone who are in these countries. Also, to unite each other. Thank you so much for taking the time. We'll welcome you back any any day. So I guess we can jump into our Q&A now. We have some great questions from the audience. Um, and I think the first one, if you don't mind me taking it, Ahmed. Um, yeah, no worries. OK, so this one is on women. And I think this might be best poised for Fatu, no? If we can bring you back on the stage. This question is from Tokunbo. And they've asked, how do we encourage women that are homebound and have a lot of skills developed and would like to contribute in climate change projects? Can you um, say the question again? Yeah, and, and I can uh, maybe share another one with you as well, because there are some who really are resonating with what you've said about women. Um, the first one is, how do we encourage women that are homebound and have a lot of skills developed and would like to contribute in climate change projects. So maybe they don't know exactly how they can get involved. What, what's your advice to them? Yeah, um, thank you very much. I, I, I think uh, in, in my presentation, I kind of like mentioned um, the issues of having women engaged or included in processes that has to do with um, making sure that their voices are heard in issues concerning um, climate action and the climate problem that we face. And uh, the fact that, that, that I see already uh, maybe shared that we have some people that are actually homebound and they have the knowledge and the, the capacities. 
So I, I think what we need there is more of partnership and collaboration with already existing organizations that are working on issues concerning women, gender, and the climate to work together and to also utilize the skills and the knowledge and the capacities that these women that are homebound that they have to make sure that we collectively work together. Because the UN Deputy Secretary General already mentioned that um, we need a, a more of collaborative efforts to make sure that we continue the fight that we have already been doing. So we just need to reach out to more grassroots communities. We need to make sure that we give them information that they need to know as far as the work that we're doing on the ground are concerned and make sure that we have all of us together, synergize our efforts, synergize the knowledge that we have, the skills that we have, so that collectively we can be able to make sure that we achieve what we have really been fighting for for over um, the past few years. So I personally believe is collaboration and reaching out. Reaching out is, is very crucial, especially for those that don't know or have any idea about what is already on the ground. Thank you so much. You know, it's great advice um, to everyone who's joining. And I think what we would love to do now is get some more interaction from the audience. Yes, so we have another question from Aja, and I think Louise, uh, you can take this one, and then anyone else, please feel free to, to chime in. How can we encourage individuals from low-income families to live more consciously, and how can we make these options more inclusive? Right, I think that's a very challenging question now, because you can't exactly go to a low-income community and talk about climate change and speech to them, because, you know, they're living on a very difficult um, kind of a budget or a kind of day-to-day -day basis. I think what's important is to create a system where, you know, the the more environment conscious and climate conscious options are what's best available to people in those in those kinds of communities. The people who are with low income can easily afford food that's fresh, healthy, locally available, um, and kind of make food systems that are accessible to them particularly because they constitute a big population. And usually people in low-income communities are also near farming communities. And as long as we can keep prices of food uh, fair and stable and make sure that it's accessible to people in low-income communities, that's what's important. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Louise. Yeah, I think, again, it's, it's so often when we are faced with big questions, we try to kind of tackle them and answer them and, you know, just we have to, it's, it's good to, and refreshing to hear that, you know, it's, it's not straightforward and that we're still trying to figure it out and that we need yeah. to figure out these questions before going into low income communities and trying to figure it out along the way. Uh, so thank you. Perfect. We have another question for um, Sophia. There's uh, two actually, one from Adriana um, and another from Namita. And they're asking essentially, one, do you produce your own climate change related education materials or mainly focus on prominent sources? Also, um, how do you adapt sources to suit people of different age ranges to reach out maybe to a wider audience in a certain country? Um, and then lastly, which it was where do we you know find this information? Where can we find that climate translated info? Yeah, so basically the way that Climate Cardinals has been working is that we're partnering with pretty like well-known institutions and good sources of information. Like for instance, the most recent project that we just took on was we're working with the UN to translate their Youth for Nature manifesto to really enable it to be the most widely transmitted in, uh, initiative on planetary health in the world. Uh, and so obviously that is something that's more geared towards young people. And then the very first translation that we did was uh, through Condé Nast and we translated their sustainable fashion climate emergency glossary. So we definitely do look at a different array of information that's suitable for a different like sorts of audiences, like with the UN one being more suitable for young people and the climate emergency glossary being more suitable for anyone who's like, I'd say high school and above. Um, but we definitely do want to focus on getting people the bare basics, like the what you need to know about climate information, uh, because we do realize that it wouldn't be super helpful to just translate like the very high, very technical like climate research, just because there's not much that people can do with that information. Um, and kind of going back to the question that was like asked earlier, I think that it's important to recognize that we don't expect people who are from poorer, more marginalized communities to be like lessening their carbon footprint or to be like bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. Because at the end of the day, this is a systematic issue and the most wealthy countries are the ones who are like 
who are contributing to the climate crisis the most. And also, I mean, 100 companies are responsible for 70 percent of our emissions. So this isn't like an individual problem. This is a the system needs to change and we need to implement regulations problem. But we just want to educate people so that they are informed when they want to vote for a politician. They want to vote for someone who's climate friendly. Uh, and once you really understand the climate crisis, then you're empowered to kind of educate your community and take initiative. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the burden of climate change is upon your shoulders. Thank you, Sophia. And thank you all. Again, this is, I wish we had an unlimited amount of time to go through these topics and we've covered a lot of ground so far. Uh, you know, as we begin to wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you how you would sum up this, discuss this discussion. Either it could be just one word, it could be a couple words, you know, you told us just one word, but I think we have some flexibility. Um, and uh, yeah, just th each of you would love to hear just how you would sum up the conversation thus far. Uh, Sophia, we'll start with you. I mean, I think the final takeaway I would give our audience is that really everyone has a part to play in combating the climate crisis. And I urge all of you to get involved to whatever extent you can. This is an issue that we're only really going to be able to sol like to solve together. And this is an issue that's disproportionately affecting our poor, lower income and people of color communities. So it's really crucial that we attack it at its source and make sure that we're working together to come up with inclusive solutions. Absolutely. Fatou? Um, I'll just I'll just wrap up by saying that this discussion has been um, quite insightful and informative. I've not only learned from my fellow presenters, but I've also been able to um, make sure that I have some takeaways that I can be able to implement at local level with my team. What I just want to say is we have um, a mission to basically protect our environment um, because this is definitely something that all of us have in common. And every action that we take, be collectively individual, has a very really significant role to play as far as protecting our environment. So let us just not fold our hands and say that we are not affected, so we are not going to take actions. Let us make sure and we understand that even if we don't take actions now, we also have to understand that the lives of the future generation is actually at risk. And we have a major role to make sure to play in preserving our environment and making sure that it is sustainable. So let us make sure we take action now because um, uh, we don't want to wait until things are already out of hands or out of control before we take action. So let us make sure we do more of action and less of talking because at this point, that is what we need. Thank you, Fatu. It's a priority and a responsibility. Louise? I think something that I took away from this panel is that this very panel itself of young women who are doing so much to protect vulnerable groups all around the world, um, if we can do it, then a lot of the people in the audience can too. You can tie in environmental stewardship intrinsically into your work and daily routine. And it's time to assume responsibility for our climate and for the people who are most vulnerable and use this connection that we all have. Now that we're all so connected, we have so much technology and resources available to us to protect the people who are most vulnerable to our climate and use these resources to begin implementing real and tangible change out of the world and leave no one behind. Be the person who makes the world a better place right now. So thank you all and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Selena, do you want to kick us off on the last poll? Yeah, so this is, we essentially want to ask all of you in the audience to also share your reflections um, and to ask how you would sum it up. So at this point, we would love if you can go to the poll. You can either scan the QR code or click on the link in the chat to answer. Um, and those of our speakers, please do join this poll as well. There's some exciting questions on next steps. So question number one is, in one word, how would you sum up today's conversation? Practice for any of you willing to sum up uh, the episode in the competition. All right, let's see. Selena, what do you think? What would be your word? Oh. Uh, ooh, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, biased now from seeing inspired. Um, my words, oh, um, would say empowered. I guess I'm feeling really um, inspired by the the incredible women that we've heard from. I think for me, it's just um, there's a sense of excitement that I now have. Uh, yeah, the urgency. That's what I'm feeling. This we got to do something now. Uh, motivational, enriching. Oh, I love this. 
I feel like we're all in the same energy right now in terms of how we're feeling. Uh, it's a great way to take advantage of Friday. Oh, strength. <laughs> oh, the thank you so much, everyone. Connected. This is how easy it is to participate in the Summit Up competition. So our next poll question is about next steps. So essentially, question two asks, after listening to today's discussion, how do you think your government can best enhance equitable inclusion of vulnerable communities in climate action? One is to provide environmental education, to host community consultations to get ideas, fund projects to increase resilience of vulnerable communities. Of course, there's always all of the above, and there is also other. So if you have a great idea that you wanna share, please tell us in the chat so we can all get on board. Oh. Ah, all of the above. It's like seems all of the be. options are popular, yeah. I know. And provide environmental education does seem like a really strong message from this this episode. It's so important to share the information and that'll take us to that next step. It's I think it's the first step is is knowing about the problem and then we can take the next steps to consult, to fund, um, and to take action on the other pieces. Thank you so much everyone for sharing your your ideas, your thoughts. Um, we'll let you know how this poll result ends. Uh, but we are coming to the near, uh, at the end of, of our hour with you. Um, and we hope you all got as much out of today's session as I think Ahmed and I did, and we do every time. We can't wait to see what the conversation has been like on social. Um, and for those of you who asked a question that we didn't have the time to get to, I'm sorry, um, but you can ask this to our speakers on their Instagram or their Twitter, or send any reflections our way. So you can check out the chat to see who to tag when you want to ask that question. Absolutely. And thanks again to our speakers and to the Deputy Secretary General for joining us uh, for just such a rich and thoughtful discussion. And please join us next month on November 18th. We'll, we'll, uh, the conversation will be all around driving ambition. And you can register now for that session at youthforclimate.live. And thank you everyone for keeping your videos on. I love how we're all in the video wall. Um, and we also want to share a big thank you to the Italian Ministry from Environment, Land and Sea, the World Bank Group's Connect for Climate program and the Office of the UN uh, Secretary General's Envoy on Youth for hosting us today. Please do follow them on social media so you can stay updated about all upcoming episodes, competitions, etc. And lastly, do not forget about the Sum It Up competition. Uh, for inspiration, mm -hmm. you can see how I summed up uh, episode three at the Connect for Climate uh, Instagram channel. Uh, now, Please turn on your video to say goodbye, and uh, we hope to see you next month for episode six. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.